First Law Trilogy by Joe Abercrombie. Go ahead. Okay, I don't know why I'm getting that message. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so this is a straight up fantasy series, hardcore if you want, and it takes place in this alternate world that's reminiscent of the Middle Ages. And in this world, at one point, hundreds of thousands of years ago, human and demons lived alongside each other when suddenly they were banished to the other side, you know, this alternate dimension, if you want. And after they were banished, several laws were put into place just for everyone to follow, just one of them being to not consume human flesh uh, for, for various reasons other than that. If you consume human flesh in this world, you become something very inhuman. And then the second law relates to the demons in regards to never interacting with the other side with the demons and never taking power from them directly. And so in the modern times in this fantasy world, unfortunately, there are some forces that are conspiring to release the demons, to get the power from them. And this is where a small band of heroes among a large cast of characters come together to try and stop those people conspiring to release the demons. And it's a very sort of <laughs> fascinating series. It's sort of hard to describe his writing style uh, Joe Abercrombie, just that when you start reading it from the first page to the very end, you just get hooked on every description he writes about, from the characters going back and forth between all their stories to the plot of the war being waged by very ambitious people and those conspirators behind the scenes and all the politics going on, the scandals, and of course, the magic. And I guess envisioning it, it's sort of like a cross between Lord of the Rings and the Game of Thrones in terms of just this epic quest to try and stop this great evil and then just all these scandals and political doings going on behind the scenes by the, all these ambitious people. But uh, yeah, the First Law trilogy is just a very well-written fantasy series that all fans of fantasy and even just beginning reading fantasy would love. And <laughs> I, I just read through the entire trilogy and I, I'm eager to keep reading all of the rest of his books. <laughs> uh, but then after that, the uh, third thing I have to talk about today. Uh, doesn't wanna, oh, there we go. Okay, <laughs> okay. So I have another graphic novel to discuss here. It's Pulp by Ed Brubaker and Sean Phillips. And this is a straight up crime story where it's set in 1930s in New York and it follows Max Winter. He's this old writer who's struggling to make ends meet where his publisher is demanding that he keep writing the same old story, these pulp westerns where his popular character goes, shoots up some bad guys, moves on to the next town, shoots some more guys. And Max is dissatisfied with that. You know, he wants to write more literary stuff, stuff that's heartfelt. But again, his publisher is demanding all these things. And then suddenly, well, out of the blue, his publisher just fires him because he's getting old and they just want the story to keep on going and going and going, making money and dissatisfied with everything, disgruntled. Max, well, he also has a bit of a secret that his stories are actually based on his own life's experience as an outlaw from the Old West. And based on his experiences and his desperation, he decides to pull one final job, nothing to lose, you know, try and provide for his family. He doesn't care if he dies, but when he's about to pull up the job, an old acquaintance from the, his time as an outlaw pulls him aside and says that he has a better job to do that will have him set for life. He doesn't have to die. It'll be all good. Unfortunately, what his old acquaintance, his friend, friend enemy, <laughs> you could say, uh, doesn't tell him is that the people they'll be ripping off in this case is the Nazi party. <laughs> and this graphic novel, it's just this really delicious mix of the Western and crime genres. And for a better visualization, I guess, it's what would have happened if um, Clint Eastwood decided to do his Western movie, The Unforgiven, and mix it with the untouchables that Kevin Costner and Sean Connery did together. And when I was reading it, I had a hard time visualizing the character of Max as somebody else. I kept seeing Clint Eastwood with his just scratchy, deep voice and also the experience with Westerns and crime 
films in the role of Max. And just, yeah, it's just a really wonderful mixing of those two genres. Mm -hmm. And I just think that if Hollywood were to get their hands on this, they would instantly make a movie and have Clint Eastwood in the role as Max. But uh, yeah, so that's the third thing I have that I talk about. And then for the fourth today, I have The Hunting Accident. Also another graphic novel. And this is a true story, a true story memoir of a person called uh, Matt Rizzo. And what happens in this story in real life is that Charlie, his young son, he's just lost his mother and he comes to Chicago in the 1960s to live with his father. And his father, Matt Rizzo, he has some tall tale. He's a blind man, but he has this tall tale about how he lost his vision in a hunting accident. And then as time goes by, you know, they bond his father and son. And well, his son, unfortunately, gets into trouble with the law and he doesn't want to name his accomplices, you know, out of loyalty. And he's about to go to prison for it. And so his father just sits down with him and has a heart to heart discussion, telling him how he really didn't actually lose his eyesight in a hunting accident, that he, in fact, was a criminal in the 1930s during the Depression, and that just like his son, he refused to name his accomplices and he went to jail for it. And in jail, his life took a really interesting turn where he met a man called Nathan Leopold Jr., who was an infamous killer. Uh, during that time and Leopold conflicted character he just took a wrong turn in life due to a, out of love for a family member but Leopold helped introduce Matt Rizzo to the wonders of poetry and Dante and so again this is just a, based on the true life of Matt Rizzo and it's interesting how <laughs> I read Dante and a little bit of poetry just for school, but after reading this, you can really tell through the artwork and the dialogue that the authors use, uh, David Carlson and Landis Blair, that just, they convey the beauty of poetry and just, they give you a glimpse into the mind, the very beautiful minds of these poets, just how they're able to convey all the raw emotions. I'm just, after reading it, I want to go back and read poetry, Dante and everything. They even include excerpts from Matt Rizzo's work because he eventually became a writer himself. And yeah, it's just fascinating to read in terms of just this true story and giving you, if you're not, not into poetry, just a glimpse into what it involves, just how it's so heartfelt and full of all these emotions. And so uh, that's the four. But then finally today I have Cloud Cuckoo Land <laughs> by Anthony Doer, Do 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 I, I cannot pronounce names, so I apologize. <laughs> but um, so this is a story that just takes time uh, across time, uh, where at the very start in the prologue, we're on a spaceship traveling through silently through space with a young girl named Constance, who's trying to figure out what the mystery to Cloud Cuckoo Land is. It's just this piece of papers, an excerpt she has of this story. And then suddenly we're shifted back to 15th century Constantinople with a girl named Anna who's trying to be a good girl according to what the church wants and take care of her sister. When she comes across as partially part of a plot to make money, a manuscript of Cloud Cuckoo Land. And from there, we're then shifted to modern day in the 20th century where Cloud Cuckoo Land, through the efforts of Anna, has been rediscovered and scholars and the like are just scrambling about trying to figure out what Cloud Cuckoo Land is about because lots of the text is deteriorated, but they've managed to store some of it. But this is where another character named Zeno, a former war vet from Korea, comes in and He's made a lot of decisions he's regretted in life and he sees Cloud Cuckoo Land as something of a way to make up for all those mistakes that he made in his life. And he doesn't know at the time that his decision to get into translating and examining Cloud Cuckoo Land will also affect another person, Seymour, a very young, distressed young boy who has just recently joined a military, a radical military group that's leading him down a very dark path. But all these characters and stories, they're connected by Cloud Cuckoo Land. And when you're reading it, 
it's not certain what Cloud Cuckoo Land is. Some people think that it's a depiction, even though it's a story of an actual place, paradise. And most people just believe it's just one of those stories that was lost in time, been rediscovered, now has this place in the museum and that's okay. But for the characters of this story, it's this beacon of hope, a light in the dark that will guide them through very dark times. And only by reading until the very end, you realize what Cloud Cuckoo Land in, is really in reality and what it represents. But um, yeah, there's just so much to discuss with this book, much more than everything I talked about today, but uh, I'll try to finish up quickly here. But uh, just that if you've read any of his books before, uh, particularly All the Light You Cannot See, um, it's written in a similar manner where all the chapters are very short, like four pages, max of about eight. Uh, his writing style, the old words and everything are still all the same, just hooks you, drags you in, you can't put it down. And also just for Cloud Cuckoo Land, uh, Dewar, Anthony Dewar, he wasn't satisfied with just it being just a fictional object out there. He actually created a story of Cloud Cuckoo Land that's very reminiscent of like Homer's Iliad or the Odyssey. And so it's very fascinating to read those excerpts of the story Cloud Cuckoo Land at the same time. But uh, to finish up, I just would say to anyone who's planning to read it, it will take a little time to get into it. It took me at least 100 pages to get into the story because he keeps shifting back between time periods. But once you get past that 100 pages, you just get dragged into the whole story of what is Cloud Cuckoo Land. And again, as I said, until you reach that very end, you just have to keep reading to know what it is exactly. And well, that's all I have to say in terms of book bites today. So I will let the next person take over and thank you for listening to everything I have to say today. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Okay, I am again having trouble advancing slides. So hold on and let's, Stop sharing and we'll try it again. Hey, Mary, did you try hitting the space bar or were using one of the arrow keys on the keyboard? I, I was using the arrow keys. Do you think the space bar might help? The space, the space bar is supposed to work. There we go. All right, Mandy, you're on. Am I? You, um, Am I the next person? It looks like it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Surprise. Surprise. I didn't know I was going first. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Did you did you share it? I did. Are you not seeing it? Mm -mm. Okay, let's try it again. Share. Share. There we go. Yeah, sorry about hey, that. Yeah, all right, good. There you go. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Mandy. Uh, I've chosen a number of books that are spread throughout a, a few different subjects for my favorites of 2021. And I hope you enjoy, I hope you enjoy them as much as I did. Can you go? Yeah, thank you. Um, the first book uh, is a fiction book that I read called The Sentence. Uh, by Luis Erdrich. This book is available through Libby and Overdrive in audiobook and ebook, and of course, as a physical book, and on the e readers on the Navy and Pink groups, available through the library. It's also going to be available as a book club in the bag sometime in the next couple of months. Um, the main character in this story, Tookie, fills many roles throughout her life. While first and foremost, she is an Ojibwe woman. She, is, she in turn is also a friend, a felon, a wife and stepmother, a grandmother, and a bookseller at a small bookstore in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She is also haunted, despite her lack of belief in the spiritual side of the world and things. In 2019, Tookie's least favorite customer, named Flora, passes away and begins haunting her in the bookstore. As the story progresses, Tookie becomes convinced that a book killed Flora, and tries to figure out how to put her spirit to rest. Of course, that's just one layer of what's going on um, because through the story, Erdrich also tries to address Tookie's feelings about George Floyd's murder 
and her realizations about what the Black Lives Matter movement means to her as an indigenous woman. Uh, it lays bare her fear and desperate love for her husband as he comes down with COVID-19 in the pandemic as well. Ultimately, this novel is layered and nuanced and the char characters are very well developed and very human, especially the main character. I really enjoyed seeing her growth as she handled each of these potentially life-changing and life-destroying events. Um, also, as an avid reader, I really appreciated Tookie's relationship with books um, because while she was in prison, she learned how to love to read with a ferocity, I think they termed it in the book. Um, and she has different stacks for like the hard reads and the easy reads. And I appreciate that because, you know, you like to swap in between them and not, don't always like to dedicate all your time to, you know, the fluff books or the really difficult books, depending on her mood, she changes between them. And she loves escaping into a book or learning something new. And so do I. So I really identified with that aspect of the character. And that was the sentence. So the next novel oh i'm having trouble here sorry mandy oh my goodness yeah i'm hitting the space bar and it doesn't want to do that so. is anything popping up on the bottom to try and navigate that way no nothing now it's huh. now it is oh, here there we go sorry about um, that <laughs> It's okay. My second book is a science fiction title by Katsuo Ishiguro titled Clara and the Sun. Um, this book is available as an ebook and an e audiobook through Libby and Overdrive, like the last one that I reviewed, and in the purple e reader group available through the library. This is a really interesting book as it takes place in a theoretical near future in the country. And the main character that from who you see the world is actually an AF, which is um, an artificial friend. So she is far more perceptive, I guess she, it, is far more perceptive and interested in people than her fellow AFs. Um, and she studies people in the shop and the people who come to look at her. She learns how to read their behaviors and speak like they do, and actually tries to understand their motivations for making decisions just from observing their behavior, which apparently is not very common um, from the perspective of an artificial anything, um, even an artificial friend. Now, what's also interesting about Clara is that she develops a worshipful feeling toward the sun because AFs are automatic, or I'm sorry, artificial friends they need solar power to recharge once every few weeks. Uh, so eventually she goes home with a sick girl named Josie and her mother. Um, in this society where most children are quote unquote lifted, which is genetically modified and intellectually enhanced in order to compete with each other for jobs and university positions, Clara meets, Clara meets Josie's best friend named Rick, who is not enhanced. He is totally normal. Uh, he, well, normal for now, not normal for then. So he and his mother are actually looked down on um, for the decision not to give him that genetic advantage or edge to compete with others. And though Rick's mother, Helen, often wrestles with the choices that she made uh, to not enhance Rick, she couldn't risk losing him. She had already lost his dad and he was the last one that she had left and she couldn't take the risk because there are certain, there's a certain percentage of children who become ill um, most often terminally from that procedure. And as the book goes on and Clara becomes as emotionally attached to Josie as I think an artificial being could be, we actually learn that that is why Josie is sick. And that is actually that she used to have a sister who actually also got sick and passed away from the same illness. Uh, that their parents' attempt to enhance them did not go as planned. Uh, as Josie becomes more ill, Clara turns to the sun as kind of a deity to help her. She tries to make sacrifices for the sun. She prays, I guess, to, she goes to visit where the sun goes down, or she tries to try and ask the sun to intervene on Josie's behalf and heal her. 
this book is an interesting pers perspective on the nature of faith and what it means to love, what people are willing to do and willing to forego for the sake of it and the many kinds of love that there are. One of the things that I really like about this book is how well developed the characters are and layered, especially Clara, she feels so compassionate and human, and yet at the same time retains a strange robotic disconnect and naivete that is really endearing. Uh, her faith that the sun can save Josie continuously throughout the book had me hoping for her sake that it would work. And so I guess you're gonna have to read the book to figure out if it did. <laughs> My third book, uh, which is also a fiction title, is entitled Liberty uh, by Caitlin Greenridge. <laughs> a Greenridge. This book is available as a book club in a bag, on ebook and audiobook through Libby and Overdrive as well, and in the Green Kindle group available through the library. This book follows the story of a young woman named Liberty Sampson during the time of Reconstruction after the Civil War. Uh, but it actually starts before the Civil War in 1860. She is born free and grows up with a physician mother in a community of free Black people in Brooklyn. It begins in 1860, as I said, when she was a child, and she lives in her mother's shadow. Um, without any real direction of her own beyond what her mother sets for her to do, she, she is told that she's going to go study medicine in an in a all-Black college in Ohio return to the practice and eventually take over. And so she does, she grows up and she learns about the medicinal plants in her mother's garden and she goes to, to Ohio. Uh, however, once she gets there, she doesn't do very well at her classes. She's the only, fee only woman or girl in a college where all of the, the science majors are essentially men. You know, all of the doctors and, and the hard subjects are, you know, only men are enrolled in those. So she feels out of sorts and she doesn't feel like she belongs there and she starts to do very badly. Uh, but before she does so badly that she is asked not to return, she meets two young women, Louisa and Experience, who sing together and sound so beautiful that Liberty longs because she's constantly trying to figure out where to belong and she didn't belong with her mom and she didn't belong in college. And she tries to figure out if she can belong with these girls but then realizes that with the love that they share for each other, there is no space for her there either. Uh, so she returns home. Uh, and when she gets there, she meets a man from Haiti named Emmanuel, who has been studying with her mother. He's, she, he's been studying medicine. And he basically sweeps Liberty off her feet. He convinces her that there are freedoms available in Haiti for a black woman that are not available in the United States and kind of sells her on the dreams that he has of Haiti and the things that he can do there. So once she gets there, so she marries him, you know, and once she gets there though, she becomes kind of lost. He becomes very controlling. She can't do the things that he promised her she, that she could do. He, she can't even leave the house. And it's just because she's a woman. And the only woman that she knows that's been able to get the freedom that she wants is Emmanuel's sister, who actually only acts insane so that people allow her to have opinions. Um, and she doesn't want to do that. She doesn't want to pretend to be insane so that she's allowed to have an opinion. So the book is a study on the nature of what it means to be truly free for black people and women in the world in the 19th century. Honestly, my opinion is I didn't really like the main character at first. Uh, she was wishy-washy and had no agency and let other people make all the decisions for her. And I've never appreciated that in any character, especially the main characters in the books that I read. Uh, but by the time we got to the end of the book, she was making decisions for herself uh, to become free on her terms. And I liked her much better as a person once she made the determination to become free from her, you know, with her own agency. Her character growth alone is a good reason to read this book. Okay, so while I do enjoy a good fiction book, I also enjoy learning to learning new things. So I always try to read some nonfiction as well. I kind of alternate uh, and I do, though I do gravitate toward history for my nonfiction. 
One such book that I read is called Facing the Mountain, A True Story of Japanese Americans in World War II by Daniel James Brown. Uh, this book is available to borrow from Libby, is available through the library, and is now available also as a book club in a bag for those who would like to introduce this book to their book club. Uh, the, of course, as you can see by the picture here, Daniel James Brown also wrote The Boys in the Boat and is well acclaimed by NPR and the New York Times. So this history mainly focuses on a group of four young men and follows them through their lives before and after World War II. They are Nisai, which are first generation, well, second generation Japanese Americans in the United States at that time. So basically their parents came over from Japan and then they were born there. So Katz Miho grew up in Hawaii on Maui, the son of hoteliers. Fred Shiyazaki was born in the mainland. His parents ran a dry cleaning business. Rudy Takiwa began his life in a farm in California, but after Pearl Harbor found himself in an internment camp along with his family. And yet he still decided to enlist and go to war for the United States. Gordon Hirabayashi was a Quaker who refused to go uh, to internment camps and abide by the curfews as he deemed the rules unconstitutional. He felt that he was a citizen, so the rules allowed to other citizens should also be allowed to him. Uh, he was punished, of course, by being put in jail throughout the entirety of World War II. And while in jail, he kind of leads insurrections, um, so he's never the jailer's favorite person because he's constantly trying to get the uh, experience of the prisoners to be a better one and have improvements being made in the jails in which he finds himself. Um, the book does a good job in illustrating the lives of these boys and following them through their various journeys during the span of World War II. From enlistment in the 442nd Reg Regiment to a life in an internment camp or one of peaceful protest, this book shows the facets of what it means to be a, Jap a Japanese immigrant or Japanese American man during the war in Europe. From the first boots in the ground to the discovery of the Nazi con concentration camps by the Nisai, this book really translates well the pain and pride. They felt so much pride and that was what blew my mind is that even as their parents were in internment camps, even as their lives were turned upside down, they were one of the hardest fighting regiments out there. And they put their heart and soul in everything out there because they wanted to prove that they were better than the way people saw them. And I really enjoyed this work and I found it really interesting. I think somebody who's interested in the history of World War II in the United States, as well as someone who is interested in different, different cultural perspectives of that time period, would really like this book as well. All right. Now, my last title is a nonfiction book, and I just finished this one relatively recently. Uh, it is The History of a Portion of the United States of America, Forget the Alamo by Brian Burrow. As with my other suggestions, this book is available as an ebook through Libby and as a physical book through the library. Now, this book addresses the myth over the Battle of the Alamo that took place in 1836. To try to reconcile the perception of the people of Texas and the larger United States, of the current state of Texas and the larger United States, with the perceptions of the Mexicans and their perception of Santa Ana about the battle. To the 200 Anglos who, di who died in the battle over the Alamo, they were fighting a tyrant who was trying to impinge on their freedoms and take away the lives that they had built for themselves in the territory. The Mexicans, own, uh, they owned the area that is now Texas and to them slavery was a moral wrong. So they wanted to abolish the slavery that the new American settlers brought with them to create and maintain a certain quality of life in the territory into which they immigrated. From Santa Ana's perspective, according to this book, they were, uh, he was trying to eliminate a threat to his ownership of the land. People who had kept coming over the border regardless of treaty or law, bringing abhorrent practices with them such as slavery and trying to steal away land that rightfully belonged to the Mexicans. This book is about more than the battle, however. It is about the myth that is formed around the battle 
over the Alamo and the history of how the situation was created and why it is known with, the, with such reverence in this country as a battle for freedom. How the myth twisted the happenings and espouses the fight for freedom, but leaves out the slavery, the invasion of Mexican soil, and the perspective on the Americans who weren't willing to accept the concessions that Santa Ana had already made and did make, and who were demanding more than he wanted to give them. Uh, the book also addresses the role of the Tejanos, which are the Mexican-American inhabitants of South Texas in the interactions with Anglos and the history of Texas, as well as the resurgence of the myth as spurred by John Wayne in the 40s and 50s. It traces the history and potential of the Alamo as a museum and addresses the arguments and the assorted protests that have taken place over time against moving parts of the monument or presenting a more inclusive perspective of the Alamo story. One of the things that's addressed in this is also I find that's interesting is them, them trying to reclaim the myth to have it be more inclusive for Latin American people who live in the in Texas now because a lot of the Mexican American or Mexicans at the time who, who took place who lived in Texas the uh, Tejanos did support the fight for the Alamo they did fight with the Anglos and their history and their sacrifices have been kind of forgotten. And as it stands, a lot of Latinos feel basically disparaged in Texas because they were against the Alamo on some level, their ancestors were, uh, but they, they own part of that history too, the, the myth, and they should appreciate, they should be able to appreciate that and be appreciated for that too. Okay, uh, now the next slide is just an addi additional selection of titles that I read that I really liked in 2021. And I hope that as you look at these titles and those on my bookmark, that you get a chance to read some of these two and enjoy them as much as I did. And that is it. Okay, we're going on to Amy. Take it away. Okay, good afternoon. I am Amy Moskowitz, the reference manager at the Haverford Township Free Library. My favorite book of 2021 was Matrix by Lauren Groff. Set in 1158, the novel was long listed for the National Book Award. In Matrix, we meet Marie de France, one of my favorite female protagonists that I've read in a long time. Interestingly, Marie de France was an actual historical figure alive at that time. However, so little is known about her that Groff was able to take many liberties in writing this novel. At the beginning of the book, Marie is 17 years old and cast out of the royal court by Eleanor of Aquitaine, her unrequited love, and sent to be the new prioress of an impoverished English abbey, where she there, she mourns her position of having to bolster these nuns who are on the brink of starvation. But soon she takes to her role and even finds joy in communing with her sisters. As Marie grows, she will have 19 visions of the Virgin Mary, which will guide her as she continues to lead and protect her abbey. As she exerts her power, she takes on roles previously only held by men, leading the women into battle, and making herself the confessor, causing some of the nuns to question and others to revere her. Called, quote, a defiant and timely exploration of the raw power of female creativity in a corrupted world, unquote, matrix from the Latin word, word for mother is a feminist powerhouse wrapped up in a 12th century novel. So now some of you know that I'm a nonfiction reader, mostly. So to see a historical fiction book as my top pick of the year is really saying something. Actually, most of my picks were for 2021 were fiction. So I think that it was really a good year to get lost in a novel. And I'd highly recommend Matrix. It is available as a book, regular and large print, as well as on a preloaded Kindle and an audiobook from our library. And it will be available in a book club in a bag starting in January. 
It can also be found on Libby as an ebook and audiobook. If you enjoy reading about strong female protagonists, look no further than The Lost Apothecary by Sarah Penner. This novel is juxtaposed between the 18th century and current day in London, weaving back and forth between the two to create a bewitching tale of murder and empowerment, Penner creates three women who are not easily forgettable. In 1791, Nella, an apothecary, doles out poisons in her back alley building, helping women get rid of the men who have wronged her, wronged them, rather. She has two rules that she lives by. Rule number one, the poison must never be used to harm another woman. And rule number two, the names of the murderer and her victim must be recorded in the apothecary's register. All is going according to plan until one day a customer turns out to be a 12 year old named Eliza. Soon an unlikely friendship begins between the two and Eliza becomes Nella's apprentice. In modern day, Caroline escapes to London to try to forget her husband's recent infidelity. But when she finds an ancient apothecary vial in the River Thames, the two worlds collide and Wiccan consequences may be in store. Library Journal called it, quote, intriguing. Readers who enjoy parallel historical slash contemporary narratives about women's lives such as Claire McMillan's The Necklace or Liz Trinot's The Forgotten, The Forgotten Seamstress, will enjoy the historical details and mystery in this engrossing tale, unquote. And, spe and quote, spellbinding, said Book Page. Quote, like in a well-brewed potion, all the ingredients have been given exactly the right level of care and time. And the result is a novel that simply overwhelms with its delicate spell, unquote. Now, as a fan of the Harry Potter series, this book really struck a chord with me. I think that I liked the potions and the poisons and um, the character of Nella really stood out to me, um, but also kind of the mystery of what was going to happen um, I liked the intergenerational friendship that Nella and Eliza had, and I liked how kind of seamlessly it went back and forth between um, the 1700s and today. The Lost Apothecary is available at the library as a book and an audiobook, as well as a book club in a bag. So if you would like this for your book club, um, it's available. However, it does have several bookings. It's also available on Libby as an ebook and an audiobook. Next slide, please. Working on it. Thank you. Just when you thought it couldn't get any better than The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo or Daisy Jones and the Six, here comes the latest novel by best-selling author Taylor Jenkins Reid, Malibu Rising. Picture this, Malibu, California, the summer of 1983. Model, pro surfer, and gorgeous celebrity Nina Riva is about to throw the party of the year her annual end of summer bash. Everyone who's anyone will be there, including her siblings, Jay, Hud, and Kit. Possibly most well-known for being the offspring of the famous singer, Mick Riva, who in my opinion was kind of formulated after Mick Jagger. They talked about like his big lips, but too bad he abandoned the family all those years ago. Anyway, the Riva children have always been close, but they all have secrets. Secrets which could destroy familial bonds, relationships, and lives. 
And by the end of Nina's party, those secrets, which start out as tiny sparks, will turn into a flame and the Riva home will burn to the ground. Follow the Riva family through the day of the party, as well as through flashbacks to Mick and his wife's early relationship to discover just what happened in this family's life. Masterfully told in a way that kept me wanting to know more. This is quote, a story about one unforgettable night in the life of a family. The night they each have to choose what they will keep from the people who made them and what they will leave behind. The Washington Post said, quote, Reed has once again crafted a fast paced engrossing novel that smoothly transports readers between decades and storylines, unquote. In a book page review, quote, Malibu Rising is packed with plenty of scintillating scandal, but Reed cultivates real empathy for her characters who form the tender heart that beats at the novel's core and are in greatest achievement, a juicy, irresistible book that will sweep readers away, unquote. Malibu Rising is available at the library as a book, regular and large print, as well as on preloaded Kindle, audiobook, and book club in a bag for your book club needs. Also available as an ebook and audiobook on Libby. Lastly, that summer. This timely novel comes on the heels of the Me Too movement. That Summer by bestselling author Jennifer Weiner is set in suburban Philadelphia. In fact, readers may recognize some locations from the main line and elsewhere. I enjoyed finding these familiar places and names as I read. But more importantly, I appreciated the focus that Weiner put on the issues of sexual assault, the role of female friendships, accountability, and coming to terms with trauma. It may have happened to you. You receive an email intended for someone else. That's what happened to suburban mom and housewife, Daisy Shoemaker. In fact, there was only one punctuation mark that distinguished her email address from this other person's. Simple mistake, but the emails kept coming. And soon Daisy found herself infatuated with the life of this other person, Diana Starling, whose life seemed glamorous compared to Daisy's. When the two women finally connect online, Daisy finds out that their communication may not have been accidental at all. Who is this Diana Starling? And what could she possibly want from someone like Daisy and her family? Booklist in a starred review said, quote, Weiner's story sk storytelling skill is such that she paints an uncompromising, complicated portrait of the insidious dangers of the patriarchy that is also a lot of fun to read. Weiner's latest is a summer banger with a ripped from the headlines plot, which is sure to garner lots of attention, unquote. And the Seattle Book Review called it, quote, a page turner reflective of the Me Too movement and the importance of accountability, it's a thought provoking and timely book, unquote. I really liked both of the lead characters in this, Daisy and Diana Starling, and could kind of actually relate to both characters at different points of the book. But one of the most interesting characters was actually Daisy's daughter. You'll have to read the book to find out why. That summer is available at the library as a book audiobook, book club in a bag, and on Libby as an ebook and audiobook. Working on it. Thank you. <sighs> Try it again.
take your time. Awesome. Again. Again. There you go. Just have to screen share it again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's try this. Share, share, share. Present. My honorable mentions this year go to Matt Haig's The Midnight Library, which technically came out in 2020, but because it was so popular, I did not have the opportunity to read it until 2021. Um, also, I did um, read a nonfiction book this year. I read several, but my favorite was probably Think Again by Adam Grant. We read that in the nonfiction book group, and that was fantastic. Um, and then Sally Rooney's newest, Beautiful World, Where Are You? Um, you can look at my bookmark to see some of the others that I read. Um, follow along with those in your Book Bites bag. Um, and hopefully you'll get a chance to read them all. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm pulling up the rear here. So, uh, so um, I... So for my books for this year, and I have to admit there are some that I read this year, but were not published in this year. So my apologies. Um, but my first book is A Place for Us by Fatima Farheen Mirza. Um, I actually read this when I led the um, Books on Tap book group. Um, and I really liked this a lot. Um, a Place for Us unfolds the lives of an Indian American Muslim family uh, gathered together in their Californian, uh, California hometown to celebrate their eldest daughter, Hadida's wedding. Um, really a match of love rather than tradition, which was kind of odd. Uh, it is here on, on really this momentous day that Amar, the youngest of the siblings, reunites with his family for the first time in three years. Uh, Rafiq and Layla, the parents, must now contend with the choices and betrayals that led to their son's estrangement, the reckoning of parents who strove to pass on their cultures and traditions to their children, and of the children who in turn struggle to balance authenticity in themselves with loyalty to the home they came from. In this narrative it span, that spans decades and sees the family life through the eyes of each member, a place for us charts the crucial moments in the family's past from the bonds that bring them together to the differences that pull them apart. And as siblings, Hadida, Huda, and Amar attempt to carve out a life for themselves, they must reconcile their present culture with their parents' faith uh, to tread a path between the old world and the new and learn how the smallest decisions can lead to the deepest betrayals. Um, this really is a story of immigration and the generations who have parents who are rooted in the culture that they came from um, and the children who were born here and the conflicts that arise from that, um, really the first generation and the second generation. Parents that want their children to embrace the traditions of the sending country and culture in the midst of a completely different culture that often has competing cultural norms and values. Um, the character of Omar shows how difficult it is for parents to look past what their culture has dubbed as quote unquote sinful behavior to really understand the complexity of Omar's challenges. Um, uh, I suspected possible learning disabilities substance abuse disorder and other things um, that I don't think were dealt with in their culture at all. Um, this book reeled me in through the stories and perspectives of the mother Layla, the sister Hadida and the brother Amar. Um, at the very end of the narration and perspective is taken up by the father Rafiq um, and adds to the complexity of this family drama and the struggles that they face, um, not just as a family, as a family with uh, first and second generation immigrants. Um, to add to that complexity, they're a Muslim family 
um, that confronts the realities of 9-11 and its aftermath and the difficulties of being Muslim in America today. Um, this book uh, is in a book club in a bag um, and it's, uh, I, it's definitely well worth a read. Um, it's also available in our catalog as a book and an audio book. And it's also available in Libby as a book, an ebook and an audio book. Uh, and uh, it was definitely worth the read. Um, I really think it's uh, um, it, it, the, the, the whole immigration story to me is fascinating. So my next book, I can get to, yeah, it even advanced, yay, um, is Oprah's recent book, uh, What Happened to You? Conversations on Trauma, Resilience, and Healing. It's actually by uh, Dr. Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey. Uh, Dr. Perry, longtime friend and associate of Oprah is a brain and trauma expert with years of work as a neuroscientist and clinical psychologist. Um, Perry has experience working with traumatized individuals and helping them heal. Um, his neurosequential model helps readers understand how the brain works and navigates trauma. Um, of course, Oprah, everybody knows, um, brings to the conversation her personal experiences with trauma and years of, inter uh, years of interviews with others who've experienced traumatic uh, experiences. Um, the book is in kind of a Q and A format. Um, uh, one uh, um, criticism from uh, a group that I uh, led this conversation about this book was that Oprah's uh, writing is in blue and it's a little difficult to read, um, but it does differentiate her um, her writing from Dr. Perry's, um, but it really is uh, kind of a back and forth. Uh, it's a conversation between Winfrey and Perry. Um, and um, I find it makes it easy to follow and breaks down some of the most complex concepts of trauma's impacts on the brain. Um, and I think uh, I have heard that this is, act I did not listen to this on audiobook, but I, I understand that both Oprah and Dr. Perry read this book. So it really feels like a conversation, almost like a podcast. Um, but I, to, to delve into the book, really our earliest experiences shape our lives far down the road. And the book, What Happened to You provides a powerful scientific, uh, it provides powerful and scientific uh, emotional insights into the behavioral patterns so many of us struggle to understand. Um, if you wondered, you know, why did I do that? Why can't I just control my behavior? Uh, others may judge our reactions and think, what's wrong with that person? When questioning our emotions, it's easy to place the blame on ourselves, holding ourselves and those around us to an impossible standard. Um, and, it, and this book is, is asserting that it's time to ask a different question. Uh, in, in this book, Winfrey shares stories from her own past, understanding through experience the vulnerability that comes from facing trauma and adversity at a young age. In, converse, in conversations throughout the book, she and Perry focus on understanding people, behavior, and ourselves. Um, it is a subtle but profound shift in our approach to trauma, and it's one that allows us to understand our pasts in order to clear a path to the future, opening a door to resilience and healing in a proven and powerful way. I think there's some hard things to read in this book about, about trauma and the examples that they use, not only Oprah, but other um, cases that Dr. Perry talks about. But I really believe that there's hope um, with this kind of shift in thinking. Um, and, and Oprah is quoted uh, in the book as, through this lens, we can build a renewed sense of personal self-worth and ultimately recalibrate our responses to circumstances, situations, and relationships. It is, in other words, the key to reshaping our very lives. Um, Perry goes on, uh, one of his quotes that I, I found really impactful uh, was, our major finding is that your history of relational health your connectedness to family, community, and culture is more predictive of your mental health than your history of adversity. This is similar to the findings of other researchers looking at the power of positive relationships on health, connectedness, 
has the power to counterbalance adversity, um, which I, I find very hopeful um, because we really cannot control the, the stuff that happened to us, um, but we, we can control the relationships that we surround ourselves with. Um, and um, I, I, as I said, I, I think there, there's something to be said about reading, listening to this as an audiobook, um, because I think it does uh, um, lend itself to that kind of conversational style back between uh, Dr. Perry and Oprah. So I, I, I found this to be a very hopeful book uh, and really just intriguing in terms of our, our new ways of, of looking at trauma um, and, um, and really asking um, some new questions. Um, this is a book that you can get in as a book club in a bag. It's also in hardback as well as audiobook uh, on Libby as well. Um, and both in ebook and audiobook. And uh, there is some suggestion that you might want to listen to this because of the conversational style. So, my next book is Harlem Shuffle by Colson Whitehead. Many people will know uh, Colson Whitehead from Nickel Boys uh, as well as Underground Railroad. Um, Harlem Shuffle is uh, kind of is the first time he's, uh, uh, or he's, he's kind of moving, moving us into the 20th century. Uh, for, for this book, um, Harlem Shuffle. I, I did find that this was a little hard to get into in the first 40 pages, um, maybe 50 pages, but after that, I couldn't put it down. So um, uh, if you first start on this book and then go, what's this, you know, can I, should I continue on? I would say absolutely uh, continue on with Harlem Shuffle. Um, it gives a I mean, I'm a historian, so it gives us this great view into Harlem in the 50s and the 60s. Um, the really uh, about the hardships in Black life in New York and in America during this time, the civil rights movement, uh, a view into the infiltration of drugs into the Black community, uh, student activism, police brutality, city and city corruption. And I'm talking about corruption on the part of everybody. Police, politicians, whites and blacks alike. It, alike. It's really, um, it's, it's kind of pretty equal opportunity in terms of the corruption that, uh, that he sees. Um, Whitehead just has this uh, amazing nuanced storytelling. Um, there are colorful characters. Uh, Freddie, his cousin, who is always dragging him into the crooked part of his world. Uh, Pepper, one of the thieves from the heist, from one of the heists in the Hotel Teresa, which is kind of the, in Harlem was like the Black Waldorf Astoria um, and uses Carney's, uh, uh, the, the, the main character, Ray Carney, uh, using his, uh, his furniture store as an answering service. Whitehead weaves historical figures, events, and language throughout the novel, um, and, and been really focuses on this main character, Ray Carney, um, who straddles two worlds, the straight and the crooked. Um, his father was a local hustler and petty thief, uh, but to his wife, customers, and neighbors, uh, he is an upstanding uh, furniture salesman. Um, and as Colson Whitehead says, Ray Carney was only slightly bent when it came to being crooked. Um, and the way he saw it, living taught you that you didn't have to live the way you'd been taught to live, which he certainly had those roots. Um, but he believed that you came from one place, but more important was where you decided to go. Um, and again, he, he, he straddles these worlds of um, being this furniture salesman um, with uh, making a decent life for his family, uh, married to his wife, Elizabeth, um, and, and uh, who's uh, also from this interesting um, kind of partition within the Black community. You have he, uh, Elizabeth's parents who live on what's called Strivers Row um, that don't approve of him because of his roots, um, and, uh, but they, they end up uh, really um, kind of... Uh, you know, there's, there's, we find that even in that world, there's, there's crookedness uh, and, and um, dishonesty. Um, the, um, but, but he also descends from this, this line of uptown hoods and crooks. Um, and that facade of normalcy um, has more than a few cracks in it, uh, cracks that are getting big, bigger all the time. Um, so his cash is tight. 
uh, especially with all those installment plan sofas. Uh, so if his cousin Freddie occasionally drops off the odd ring or necklace, Ray doesn't ask where it comes from. He knows a discreet jeweler downtown who doesn't ask questions either. But then his cousin Freddie falls into a crew who, who robs the Hotel Teresa, the Waldorf of Harlem, and volunteers Ray services as a fence. Uh, and the heist doesn't go as planned. Uh, they rarely do. Uh, and now Ray has new clientele made up of shady cops, vicious local gangsters, two-bit pornographers, and other assorted Harlem lowlifes. And it really become, it really starts this internal hustle between Ray the striver and Ray the crook. Uh, and as Ray navigates this double life, he begins to see who actually pulls the strings in Harlem. Uh, can Ray avoid getting killed, save his cousin, and grab his share of the big score, all the while maintaining his reputation as a go-to source for your quality home uh, uh, furniture needs. Uh, Harlem Shuffle uh, is an ingenious story. It plays out beautifully, and um, it's uh, a recreated New York City of the early 1960s. Uh, it's a family saga uh, masquerading as a crime novel, a hilarious morality play, a social, no a social novel about race and power. And it really is ultimately a love letter to Harlem. So I highly recommend Harlem Shuffle. Um, you will fall in love with these characters. So my next book, and I have lost my script, so you're gonna just have to um, bear with me for a second. Of course, I've lost it. So I am going to quickly pull up my script. My next book is The Four Winds. So just bear with me for a second. Pull up. Okay, this is The Four Winds by Kristen Hanna, and I will share again, see if I can do this. I'll go back to sharing. Uh, of course, now you're seeing my script, so bear with me again here. Oh. Share that. I can do this without. Okay. Are you all seeing that now? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, Kristen Hanna, and I'm still not able to pull up my script. So, and I want to say I have so many great things to say about this one. So. I apologize. Um, so the four winds. Um, what I love about um, about this book is that it's it's historical fiction. 
Um, Kristen Hanna is uh, known for, uh, um, she's, she's a, an established writer. This uh, is her foray into the Great Depression. Um, she focuses on Elsa, who is the main character. It's really a very unloved character at the beginning um, by her family. Her family is a uh, kind of kind of considered upstanding and middle class in uh, the north, the, the panhandle of, of North Texas. Um, she is, um, uh, but but finds finds love in her husband's family. She ends up having uh, kind of a, a moment of of uh, rebellion, uh, and then finds that she's pregnant uh, and joins her husband's family uh, in North Texas. This is all uh, starts in the 20s, and then eventually uh, it we see her again in the 30s during the beginning of the Dust Bowl, uh, and her family, the Martinellis, who uh, are, are hardworking farmers um, and are trying really hard to stay afloat uh, during the Great Depression. Um, and her husband, who really just kind of um, is just not there and eventually leaves the family. Um, and it's really about the decisions about uh, staying on the land in, uh, in the Southern Plains or uh, hearing the siren call to go to, uh, to California because there are um, there's supposedly jobs there. Um, eventually, Elsa and her children um, join, join the group that goes to California um, for, for, for work um, and the, the real hardships. They are what they call Okies who end up in California. Um, I, I think that Hannah really weaves this amazing tale, uh, and especially when they get to California, the hardships um, that they encounter. Um, I, it's, just, it's just breathtaking. Um, if anybody ever, uh, you know, um, you know, most of us read uh, Steinbeck's novel uh, about uh, about the Great Depression um, and uh, the Grapes of Wrath. Um, I think this really is in that. Um, you know, I, I think you can also get a real view into um, you know what was happening to Americans and especially what was happening to people in the Southern Plains. Um, I think that. Um, uh, this book kind of because I'm a historian, it got me really curious as to what happened to the Okies after uh, this period of time when they came to Southern California. There are definitely folks that went back to the Southern Plains, but there's a lot who stayed in Southern California in, in the Bakersfield area. Um, and I was curious to know. Um, so what happened to them? Did they, you know, they weren't they weren't desperate, you know, you know, there were many generate there have been many generations since. Um, and, and I was doing some reading. I think they did change the character of California um, and they brought their, their, um, their values and their, and their culture with them to California. Um, if anybody is a, 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 um, a country music fan, uh, when, they, when people talk about the Bakersfield sound, that is an oaky sound. That is uh, people from the Southern Plains who brought their music and especially their, their country music to California and um, people like Merle Haggard are Okies uh, and they are really the, the, um, the um, they, are, they are that culture that has been handed down through the generations. So I thought that was really interesting. Sorry about that, uh, that pause, uh, you know, it, it just never, it, it uh, never fails that something's gonna go awry. Um, I wanted to tell you just about a couple more things that I read, I won't talk about them, but I do uh, recommend them. Um, uh, Deacon King Kong, James McBride's most recent novel, uh, I thought was excellent. And another view into, um, you know, uh, Black life in uh, New York City. This is more in the late uh, 60s. Um, it, it really is. I love James McBride's writing. He just has this humor, uh, even around things that are kind of hard to, to read about. Um, he really just has a great way of his writing. And I, I highly recommend that. I have been on a tear reading Jacqueline Winspear this year. Uh, and The Consequences of Fear was her 16th novel that was uh, 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 written and um, published in 2021. Um, Maisie Dobbs is, uh, you know, is just a great mystery character uh, and I highly recommend that. And then The Splendid in the Vile, uh, Eric Larson's most recent book about 
World War II and uh, the first year of Churchill's uh, being prime minister and the, the Battle of the Britain. It's just, it's a nonfiction book, but it just, it reads like a novel um, and it is a real page turner. Um, so those are things I've read and just things I'd like to read in 2022. Um, the Lincoln Highway, Armored Poles, the really exciting thing is that this has just come out as a book club in a bag for us. So give us a call if you'd like to book it for your book club. Um, Renee Brown, I know some people like, don't like her, some people do. Um, this, I, I heard her being interviewed uh, a little while ago about her latest book, Atlas of the Heart, Mapping Meaningful Connection and the Language of Human Experience. Um, I, I, I just, I thought it was really interesting. Um, and, and then Stanley Tucci, I fell, I, I've always liked him, but I, if anyone saw his CNN uh, series about finding Italy and uh, touring uh, Italy and foods, um, this is actually his memoir. Um, and it's uh, food has pro figured prominently in his life. Uh, and of course, anybody who's ever seen uh, his big night uh, knows that uh, he, you know, he's he's got that place in history of of one of the best food films of all time. So um, those are the things I'd like to read in 2022. Uh, and I think that may be it for our presentations. Um, I'm going to stop sharing, and we're back. Um, so uh, that's it for our presentations. If you did not get our bookmarks in your bag. Um, please come back. We were a little delayed on getting them into the bag. So if you came early and didn't see the book, the bookmarks, all of the ones we talked about today uh, are, are going to be um, available so you can keep track of what we talked about. Um, there's also a bookmark from our circulation department. Many of you interact with our circ department and they always have good recommendations for you. So um, come on back to the library if you didn't find them in your bag. Um, so I would just uh, throw it out here to the rest of my reference colleagues. Amy, any last words about books at the library this year, if you're still here? I, I'm here. Um, I would just like to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, thank you all so much for um, coming to the library and for your support of the library and for your support of all of us. Um, we love seeing you. We're so glad to be back in person this year um, and to get to interact with all of you um, every day. And um, yeah, we just we're so happy to be able to do what we do and um, share our love of reading with you. So um, thank you all again for joining us today and for um, supporting our library. Thank and you. I, I did record this. I, I, I was just a little delayed. So it will be available if anybody missed it. If anybody in your world missed it today, it will be on YouTube and uh, you can access it there. So thanks everybody for joining us. And Thank you. we hope you all have happy and healthy holidays and we will see you in the new year. Thanks. Bye everyone. Bye. Thank you.